legal paper number three. All the rest of this stuff did not get done. So today will be equally as bad. If Cablevision would live by the law, and if the Dolans would stop cheating you and other members of the public, Lindora could get her work done. This is the Texaco Task Force. Uh, background. Uh, Roberts versus Texaco. Uh, was a lawsuit brought up against Texaco who were caught discriminating against blacks and against women. Uh, they were seriously in violation of both state and federal equal opportunity laws. They were brought to the United States District Court, Southern District of New York. One of the worst judges we have, Charles L. Bryant, was assigned to the case. Uh, the case blew wide open when one of the employees at a deposition, uh, I think it was Lundgren, uh, pulled out a tape recorder of one of the conversations of Texaco executives about blacks and about women. That blew the whole case apart immediately. It was an explosion. Uh, the New York Times tried to cover Bryant's uh, adjudication, but the New York Times was forbidden by Bryant, a typical Gestapo, uh, an anti-American. Bryant would huddle in the jurors' room and have conferences that were off the record. That's typically Bryant. Bryant was trying to manipulate this case instead of doing his job, which was for you, America, protect America. But that is Bryant's history for many, many, many years. Uh, finally, uh, Bryant had his way, and it was a cop-out, and the case was settled. Part of this settlement was something like $470 million damages that Texaco shareholders had to pay for Peter Bajur's uh, violation of state and uh, U.S. laws. Now, he's still violating state and New uh, York laws. He will not let me, a shareholder, see the books, records, and minutes. He's extremely secretive, Peter Bajur and uh, fugitive, and uh, he just keeps running away from the truth. And you and I know what's going on. Well, uh, another part of the settlement was that Texaco had to appoint a task force to monitor Texaco's activities and to increase their tolerance of and uh, non-retaliation on and their non-prejudice of blacks and women, comfortably called minorities or uncomfortably called minorities. So this task force is in its fourth year and this is the fourth task force that I've read to you. And uh, this uh, Franklin picked up at the Texaco headquarters, and you can walk in. Anybody can walk in and get a copy of this. That was part of the uh, cop-out uh, settlement. I oppose the settlement, as you know. I oppose it with everything I had, uh, money and time and labor. Uh, it was a cheap settlement. It was an anti-American settlement. The case was truncated. It should have gone before a jury and a jury should have decided it, and everything in the case should have been revealed to you, the public, because you have a First Amendment right to know. And so uh, this was picked up along about the 19th of September. I had no time to work on it because of the equal massive breaking of the law by Charles Dolan, another crooked CEO. 
uh, and here is the title page. Uh, what they say is the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, and it's uh, in re Texaco Task Force on Equality and Fairness, District, a uh, docket number M10469. See, not right at the way, that's a cover up. They're trying to cover up that it's Roberts versus Texaco. Discrimination against blacks and women. And actually, it should have a case number like 98 Civ blank, 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 Charles L. Bryant. Well, it does have that, but they don't print it here. The third annual report of the Equality and Fairness Task Force for the year ending June 30th, 3000. It's not the third. Well, it may be third annual, but it's the fourth report. And here's who the, uh, who's on the task force. Honorable Thomas S. Williamson, Jr., Chair. Well, I crossed out Honorable. Honorable John L. Gibbons. I crossed out Honorable. Dr. Jaffleen Johnson, Alan J. Crow. He was fired as a director during the Roberts versus, uh, or soon after, Texaco. Professor Marie J. Matsuda, uh, Louis G. Nogales. Dr. James M. Rosser, submitted July the 31st, uh, 2000. I think it's supposed to be submitted on August the 31st each year. And I say this case never should have been settled. The settlement was a cop-out. And this task force is a meaningless trade-off. The case should have gone full course to a jury. Bryant cheated, as always. Signed, Bondora. Now, here, here is what they deal with. This is how they try to uh, order. No prejudice, no retaliation, fairness. Those things cannot be ordered. Okay, if they could be ordered, human being Brian, Bryant, Charles L. Bryant, should have been ordered to stop his retaliation and his prejudice and to be fair and to be objective. Table of contents. Introduction, the task force's methodology, executive summary, diversity learning experience, measure and reward diversity, job posting, Affirmative action plans, mentoring, performance management process, job competency development. Well, at that, Peter I. Bajour fails. Succession planning, employee development, minimizing fear of retaliation. This cannot be ordered by a court. Bryant never controlled his. Bryant is one of the most retaliatory persons I've ever met. And he does this in a black robe. Minimizing fear of retaliation. Ombuds program. Employment selection and performance management. I'm glad they call it ombuds. To say ombuds person. You can't say ombuds man anymore. So you have to say ombuds person. So good that they shorten it to ombuds. Employment selection and performance management. Uh, detailed assignment and conclusions. Diversity learning experience. Measure and reward diversity. Job posting, affirmative action plans, mentoring process, performance management process. They just repeat all those for uh, detailed assessment. In conclusions. Now, I have marked this up slightly. They think they're getting away with nobody notices. But we have watchdogs. This is my log. 
uh, I had to make up the backlog for September, so I worked five minutes a day for each day from September to October to today. It's all up to date. And introduction, pursuant to paragraph 24 of the stipulation and settlement agreement, called the settlement agreement, quote unquote, signed by the parties in Roberts versus Texaco, 94 Civ. 2015. Remember the number. 94 Civ 2015. This is six years later. The Equality and Fairness Task Force, short name, Task Force, submits to the court and to plaintiff's counsel its third annual report for the period ending June 30th, 2000. Glendora wants to know the names of the plaintiff's counsel. The settlement agreement, Glendora says, is a hoax. Under paragraph 16 of the settlement agreement, the task force is charged with overseeing and evaluating Texaco's implementation of diversity training, mentoring, management compensation, and job posting programs, as well as Texaco's systems for minimizing employees fear of retaliation in response to filing discrimination complaints. You can order retaliation out of Peter I. Bajur. Bajur is a robber. This is impractical, Glendora says, it's pie in the sky. The task force is also responsible for evaluating revising and or replacing Texaco's affirmative action plans, performance management program, and the company's succession planning and job competencies models, paragraph 17 of the settlement agreement. These were the things that didn't work, and this is why the lawsuit was brought, Roberts versus Texaco. Now, in the third year of the five-year term set forth in the settlement agreement, the task force continues to work with Texaco to establish and implement successfully a comprehensive human resources program that promotes fairness and equal opportunity in all aspects of the Texaco employment experience. Now, all of these things, fairness and equal opportunity, are just plain not in Peter I. Bajur's makeup. The task force reports that Texaco's performance during the past year is, again, generally quite favorable. Mm-hmm. Although we note challenges that Texaco continues to face in fulfilling the various mandates set forth in the settle agreement. Uh, does this quite tell you where uh, the task force stands? Uh -huh. Is there any collusion here? Lindora says the settlement was against the public interest. You're the public against your interests as are all of Charles L. Bryant's cop-outs. Texaco has maintained its commitment to pursuing ambitious equal opportunity and diversity goals despite a severe downturn, downturn in the oil industry, business conditions due to depressed oil prices now, that's an out-and-out out lie. It's almost $2 a gallon, and they're giving as an excuse depressed oil prices. It's a lie that persisted into late 1999. The fact that Texaco has not compromised its commitment, and I say ho-ho, ha-ha, hee-hee.
Let's see. It's not compromise, it's commitment. I guess we'll have to pick this up later. So here's page three. We make special note in our second annual report that Texelco has been a responsive and resourceful partner. This is a paid announcement, Glendora says. For Texaco in, to, in the effort to ensure fairness and equal opportunity to Texaco employees by improving the company's human resources program. Well, of course, Roberts versus Texaco, it was about employees, but it was also about, uh, I think, independent contractors that Texaco would not hire. Uh, contract with uh, minority groups, blacks and women, to do special outside work. Texaco has remanded supportive has been something. Uh, supportive of the task force mission and we again make our appreciation of Texaco's efforts in the regard to, to that regard isn't that terrific you got a task force and whose side are they on and you want to know something that one of the people on this task force was given the job a big job in the law department of Texaco taken off of the task force so that was showing you uh, whose hand he was kissing, right? Uh, Glendora says, we all knew this would not work. Uh, regarde by Jure's behavior at the annual meeting, April 17, 2000. You saw how, how Bajur behaved. Nobody could have been more autocratic. Uh, nobody could have been uh, more un-American. Nobody could have been more undemocratic than Peter I. Bajur at the annual meeting when Glendora cornered him. Uh, Glendora wants to attend the next task force meeting. Give her the time, the date, and the location. Now let's watch that. Watch what happens on that request. Executive summary. Texaco remains dedicated to creating a workplace that operates on the fundamental principle of respect for the individual. Oh yeah, Baishua really shows that, doesn't he? Where employees are treated fairly without regard to race, religion, color, national origin, age, sex, or sexual orientation, a disability, a veteran status, or position within the company. Ha, ha, ha. Dictated by Jure would not let directors answer Glendora's question at the annual meeting, censorship. Through the values espoused by its leadership and its efforts to improve its employment practices, the company continues to communicate effectively the message that it will not tolerate discrimination, harassment, or retaliation in its workplace. What did Bajor do at the annual meeting? He tolerated dictatorship. He tolerated Gestapoism. He tolerated censorship. And that equality and fairness for all employees are central to the mission as a highly competitive business enterprise. And Charles L. Bryant, the guy who ordered this quote unquote, uh, does all of these things. He discriminates, he harasses, and he retaliates. What kind of a place do they think America is? And whom do they think they're kidding? They know whom they're kidding themselves. They aren't kidding us, are they folks? Glendora wants a second opinion. Who is monitoring the task force? I want somebody to monitor the task force. Now that's the end of page three. Now page four is printed upside down. So Glendora says, stand on your head. Do you know why judges stand on their heads, folks? 
so they can turn things over in their minds. Now, the company has also used technology to improve communication with employees about these processes by cr creating an employee zone uh, internet or intranet, they say, a website dedicated to giving employees information and instruction about Texaco's human resources practices and politics. I want to know why we don't have any affidavits from people at Texaco saying, gee, this is really working. Gee, this has really helped. Gee, this got rid of discrimination. This got rid of prejudice. Yeah, th gee, this is really good. I don't see any affidavits from employees. Do you folks? Those determ uh, deteriorating business conditions continued into most of the first half of this reporting period as well. And Texaco is getting about $2 a gallon for oil. <laughs> Pink lie. The percentage of women in Texaco's workforce increased moderately from 26.0% to 26.6%. Big accomplishment. Big increase. And the representation of women among new hires increased as well, 40.4% to 49.4%. Individuals from minority groups made up 44% of new hires, and together women and minor minorities were 67.7% of all new employees. Although we occasionally heard comments that opportunities for white males were minimal or non-existent, that's what you call reverse discrimination, the reality is that approximately 32.3% of new hires in 1999 were white men. You remember Jim Burness, the Irish Express, and Kelly Burness, his daughter? They brought a lawsuit against a condominium uh, in uh, Manhattan. Jim was the uh, super, and uh, they uh, fired Jim uh, to hire a Hispanic. This is what you call reverse, uh, re uh, reverse uh, discrimination. So Jim brought a lawsuit against them uh, as discrimination against European Americans, Jim Burns called it. Uh, he's talking about the Irish. And uh, he brought that uh, lawsuit in uh, Hopog at the United States District Court. And uh, the judge on that was Wexler. And Jim told me that Wexler said to him one day, you know something, I don't like your lawsuit. And another time, uh, Wexler, Jim reports to me, said, uh, I haven't even read your lawsuit. Well, I believe that. I don't think a United States judge reads anything. They hire a flunky law clerk, uh, first job out of law school to do all their uh, dirty work. And, uh, but one day, uh, Jim, and Jim went pro se, by the way, and somebody asked him, well, you know, how'd you get all that? Why did you do all that? Where'd you get all that? I, and he pointed to me. Uh, and so one day, uh, the lawyers were there, and uh, they were talking to Jim, and the law clerk came in, Wexler's law court came in, as is told to me by Jim Burness, and he said to the lawyers, you'd better settle. The lawyer says, what? Settle, settle, oh, settle. And they did have to settle, and Jim got paid. So that was an, in a very interesting discrimination case. And what did you win on, Jim? Well, I won on uh, European Americans, discrimination against European Americans, and I also won on the American Disabilities act. Good for him. Uh, Texaco also continued to increase diversity within its executive ranks and among promoted employees. 
1999, the representation of women and minorities in executive positions at Texaco increased from 18.9% to 20.0%. Ooh, that's marvelous. Two-tenths of a percent. Women as a group increased from 10.4% to 10.5%. Ooh, 0.1%. Of the executive employee population and minorities grew from 9.4% to 10.5%. These percentages indicate that Texaco is making progress in improving. Kiss my hand. Kiss my hand, task force. Kiss by Jour's hand. Get down on your knees to him. Now, has Brian ever responded to any of these four task reports? Not to my knowledge. So that's the first four pages. Uh, I've done up to ten. We'll take a break and we'll do something else. And so far I've spent three hours on it and four dollars and a half. It's eleven o'clock, folks. And much has intervened. Much has happened. I just got back from uh, Mount Vernon High School. There's a security guard on the driveway. All of the doors are locked. There's only one set of doors that's open, and it's a mile and a half from the TV studio where you want to go. And I am very saddened by this. I've spoken to you about it before. This is not a republic. This is a police state. These children are growing up in a police state. They don't know anything but a police state. They don't know what a republic is. They don't know what a democracy is. It's a police state. I had a long talk with Jeff Cosella, who is the teacher of the uh, visual arts, uh, the uh, TV studio and the TV production. Long talk with him. <clears throat> and. Uh, franchise renewal is coming up. Now this system is owned by, it's the old Paragon system, and it's owned by Time Warner. And uh, when that uh, franchise renewal comes up, I want to have a lot to say, and Jeff is going to keep me posted because he says that he wants what I have to say heard. He said that uh, Bob uh, somebody uh, said to him, so Zach Glendora, she really pounds the cable companies. Yes. And uh, we're going to do it more. Uh, Jeff is upset because of Madison Square Garden. Uh, he's a Rangers fan. He's paying more now for this Metro uh, thing, and he's seeing less Rangers. So he's very articulate and very intelligent. And so I asked him to uh, put it down and write it to the FCC and to write it to the New York State uh, Public Service Commission, to Steve Shea. Shea spells his name unusually. It's not S-H-E-A, it's S-H-A-Y-E. Uh, I took uh, Rusty with me, of course. The weather is impeccable. The weather is perfect. Sunny, clear blue sky, no wind, no rain, and warm. It's nice. And so I don't understand, Rusty, why he spends so much time at a shrub. He spends so much time at the shrub, and you try to get him away, and he won't come away. And then finally he leaves his calling card, and then he comes away. I don't understand that dog, except that he's a very good dog. Uh, the 13 morning, actually it's about 16 morning chores got done, all except the end mail, because there are five legal papers left over from the last backlog of 17 legal papers that have to be done first before you even look at the end mail. Okay, so I am reading to you uh, the uh, Texaco Task Force, and we are up to page 5. Uh, and he's talking about, they are talking about women and minorities at upper levels of the company. But white men continue to be disproportionately represented in the executive ranks of the company. Bajur is a misogynist. So is Bryant. Bryant is the one who let him get by with his trash. 
Women and minorities received 66.7% of the total number of promotions awarded in 1999, with women receiving 57.6% and minorities, including minority women. See, they like black women because that's a double token. Two for one. Receiving 28.8%. White men received a third. 33.3% of the promotions in 1999. Now, Texaco acknowledges that despite successes and progress gained thus far in initiatives to improve the human resources programs, continued commitment throughout the company is required to transform the initiatives into practice that survived the life of the task force. Survived the death of the task force. In particular, educating all employees about the initiatives and deepening their understanding of the value of equal opportunity and diversity to the company's business goals and competitive capabilities are areas that will require sustained effort and attention if Texaco's vision of equal opportunity in its workplaces to prevail. What are they saying? an even more exacting standard for 2000 by targeting 28% representation task force and we are up to page five uh, and he's talking about they are talking about women and minorities at upper levels of the company but white men continue to be disproportionately represented in the executive ranks of the company Bajur is a misogynist so is Bryant Bryant is the one who let him get by with his trash Women and minorities received 66.7% of the total number of promotions awarded in 1999, with women receiving 57.6% and minorities, including minority women. See, they like black women because that's a double token. Two for one. Receiving 28.8%. White men received a third. 
three percent of the promotions in 1999. Now Texaco acknowledges that despite successes and progress gained thus far in initiatives to improve the human resources programs continued commitment throughout the company is required to transform the initiatives into practice that survive the life of the task force survive the death of the task force in particular educating all employees about the initiatives and deepening their understanding of the value of equal opportunity and diversity to the company's business goals and competitive capabilities are areas that will require sustained effort and attention if Texaco's vision of equal opportunity in its workplace is to prevail. What are they saying? It's not going to work. What have we been saying all along? It's not going to work. It was a rotten, lousy settlement. But Brian wanted to get rid of the case. That's the way Brian does. He'll do anything to get rid of a case. He will lie. He will steal to get rid of a case. He'll do anything to get rid of a case. If the order, Glendora says, is to be complied with, the case never should have been caught. It should never have been settled. The task force, writes the task force, will continue to assess Texaco's responses to these challenges as well as monitoring the ongoing effectiveness and impact of Texaco's human resources programs. With a chairman like Peter I. Bajur, you're not going to have fairness and equality. He is a dictator. Now, this paper came to us with a claim. The task force should have a legal, should know enough that a legal paper has to be bound. A clamp is not sufficient. A clamp is in a court file is anathema. What happens when the pages get unclamped and fall on the floor? Nobody's going to put them back together. So the task force certainly should know enough to bind a legal paper. Diversity learning experience, paragraph 16a of the settlement. Bajur needs this. Bryant needs this. Texaco continues to administer diversity and sensitivity training to new U.S.-based employees through the mandatory diversity learning experience program. That's part of the settlement. But Bryant needs to learn that. And Bajur needs to learn that. And Glendora wants to see a tape of this. How do they teach people diversity learning experience? I want to see a videotape of it. A total of 339 employees in 1999 participated, participated in the diversity learning experience training. An additional 328 employees had yet to participate, including 184 newly hired employees. As a complement to the diversity learning experience program, Texaco set in motion additional strategies to provide its employees opportunities for ongoing diversity learning and training on a, on a voluntary basis. These strategies include developing a resource guide well, I want to see the resource guide, don't you? And uh, we're on page six. Says the task force, Texaco developed plans to integrate. And Glendora says, to integrate requires integrity. And there is no integrity in Bryant, and there's no integrity in Bajura. I have personal knowledge. Uh, task Force says employee responses to the 1999 Vision and Value Survey. Glendora says, what is this? Let's see one in action. Uh, however, the task force again may, notes a concern expressed in our last report despite evidence suggesting that Texaco has become more productive as it has become more diverse, backlash, quote unquote, comments that generally paint women 
and minorities as undeserving beneficiaries of diversity effects were frequently asserted by a vocal minority of employees. Glendora's big oil. Big oil. To an unfortunate degree, we found that though these backlash sentiments are often fueled, you see that's an oil term, fueled, by inaccurate or incomplete information about the company's equal opportunity and aff affirmative action programs, OPEC. In addition, the task force received reports that some employees, including notably supervisors, view the diversity activities of the company and of employees as at odds with the company's business goals instead of being instrumental to employee development and to commercial success. What I say about this, if they had been fair and honest and if they had been moral and ethical in the first place, there never would have been a Roberts versus Texaco. There never would have been this lousy settlement. And there never would have been this opprobrious task force where you try to order by a court people to be not prejudiced, not retaliatory. While the task force appreciates that affecting change in employee attitudes is difficult, and I say down at the bottom of page six, who monitors the task force? Do you think I trust them? Do you trust them? No. What about you? Okay, when we, uh, I've started writing legal paper number one for the day out of five, including the in-mail, which I'm not going to look at until I get these five done. Uh, and this one is the New York City Parking Violations Bureau, which is running a civil recall uh, in the Bronx, taking people's cars, saying that people didn't pay uh, their parking summonses when they never even notified the people that they had parking summonses. That whole mess is in the uh, United States District Court in Arkansas, excuse me, misspoke, in Alabama. And uh, I am writing an atrocious paper put out by a lawyer who works for the city of New York. But then what else would you expect? I'll be reading that to you shortly. And I want to get the Texaco Task Force uh, up to page 10 if I can. The uh, New York City Parking Violations Bureau uh, legal paper has been written. And while it's being printed, I could read you maybe pages 7 and 8 of the Texaco Task Force. It's about the measure and reward of diversity uh, 25% representation of women and minorities among officials and managers. Because Texaco did not meet the 25% goal in 1998, the company withheld a portion of the bonus that was contingent upon the goal. Despite missing the 1998 goal, Texaco raised its target to 26% for 1999, notwithstanding a 9.9% .9 overall reduction in the number of the officials and managers in 1999. The company exceeded its target and correspondingly increased the goal contingent por uh, portion of the bonus paid to eligible employees. The company has set an even more exacting standard for 2000 by targeting 28% representation of women and minorities among its official officers, officials and managers. Who pays the task force? Shareholders? Shareholders. How much does this task force get paid. What is this costing the shareholders? S 
So they get paid for it. Money talks. A second diversity performance message in Texaco's incentive bonus plan uh, based upon compensation on the level of favorable responses to vision and value survey, Glendora says, let's see it. Questions concerning Texaco's respect for the individual. We know that Texaco has no respect for the individual as Texaco stands under Peter I. Bajur. Peter I. Bajur pays no attention to respect for the individual. Peter I. Bajur pays no attention to being a good corporate citizen. You saw that at the annual meeting. The percentage of favorable responses to the questions increased in 1999 and accordingly Texaco compensated eligible employees with bonuses above the 5% target figure associated with that measure. So you work for Texaco and you're going to get paid for being tolerant. You're going to get paid for being fair. You're going to get paid for being non-retaliatory. You're going to get paid for being non-prejudiced. How's that? I'll read you page 8 just as soon as I turn this uh, printing over. Money talks, folks. has advised a task force that the subjective rating system has not adversely affected women and minorities who were appraised during the reporting period. Glendora says, how do you prove this? Did Bryant get paid for the settlement? What does all this cost the shareholders? Now the posting, this is job posting, and this is paragraph 16E of the settlement. Data on job postings in 1999 indicate that 410 of 478 jobs were posted, 86%. Well, I want to know, was that posted after somebody else was told about them and got there first? In other words, timely? Sixty-eight jobs, 14 percent, were accepted from posting in accordance with the company's established policy for allowing exceptions. This is what you call by your bifurcation. The 14 percent level of posting exceptions in 1999 represents more than a 50 percent decrease from the year before in the number of jobs that were accepted from posting. What do you say to that? It's HP. What does HP stand for? Hanky panky. Through an approach known as competency-based selection, also known as targeted selection. Remember what targeted selection means. It means competency-based selection. And this is all rhetoric. The settlement was anti-American. And that finishes page 8. About page 9, they mention uh, that we received uh, numerous comments from employees with diverse backgrounds that targeted selection had significantly enhanced the uh, fairness of the job posting selection. Well, Glendora wants to see that. I want to see that. I want to see affidavits from employees. Preliminary evidence suggests that the company has decreased the time that elapses between posting, interviews, and communications of decisions in to candidates. I would like to see the arithmetic on that. Would you? 
I would like to see the arithmetic on that. And the poor people, they got hurt when they told they didn't make it. That's an awful hurt. That's a terrible hurt. And Glendora says, what does it all add up to? Failure. The settlement does not work. And that's page 9. Page 10 is Affirmative Action Plans, paragraph 17E of the settlement. Executive Order number 11,246. That's from the, uh, the CEO and the people in the executive office who run away and hide when you call them on the phone. Uh, from traditionally underrepresented groups, women, blacks, Hispanics, as we reported last year, the company expanded the reach of the people pipeline. People are like oil, okay? They go through a pipeline. That was last year. Was no increase implemented this year, Glendora asks. The Texaco's executive business analyst EBA, they're going to be using that abbreviation. Remember, it stands for Texaco's Executive Business Analyst. Uh, High-performing MBA, Master, Bachelor's, MBA. Used to be MBS, Master of Business Science. BS had a bad connotation. And uh, Bachelor of Arts must be Master Something of Arts. Anyway, graduates in 1999, including six women, two African Americans, two Hispanics, and five other minorities, and three white males. The number of women includes minority women. And as I told you, that's a double token. When you hire a black woman, you get two points instead of one. Uh, the overall, um, any, uh, the steering committee uh, functions as a vehicle, again an oil reference, for integrating business units, college hiring, and recruitment needs with overall corporate. I said, is that what they were wearing, overall? The company also expanded liaison team activities in 1999 to solidify relationships with the Society of Women Engineers. Uh, this is the log, second page of the log of Glendora's uh, scrutiny of this uh, settlement, which of course is never going to work. Uh, to pursuing equal opportunity and diversity in the face of such conditions is impressive. And they're getting $2 a, a gallon for gasoline. $2. Glendora is not convinced. Uh, the task force methodology. Uh, following the approach established during our first two years, the task force met for two-day or one day periods on a monthly basis except for August. We continued our, they get a month's vacation. We continued our um, practice of periodically convening meetings at selected field locations of Texaco. Uh, what did the food and the lodging cost the shareholders for this task force to meet? Bajur is the one who should have paid for it. It was the management who was responsible for Roberts versus Texaco in the first place. So the management should pay for it, and the board. Bakersfield, Denver, Houston, New Orleans, and also met with employee groups at headquarters in Harrison, New York, during the reporting period. Uh, Bajur's liar for hire, his name is Kevin Price, or what is his name? Something Price, remember the one we spent uh, hours and hours reporting to you on uh, the guy who was hired to lie for Bajur 
and to say that it was okay for Baijiu to break New York state law and federal law. His name is Price. He didn't even know that Texaco is in Harrison, New York. It is not in White Plains, New York. The postal address is White Plains. Was Bajur there? Did Bajur ever go to one of these meetings? Frank discussions, they say. Well, Glendora wants to hear it on audio tape. Okay, now. We, I will continue working on this uh, New York City Parking Violations Bureau uh, civil recall that I'm suing them in uh, Alabama and I'll get back to you on that. Folks, this is the uh, Beltrano paper. Who is Beltrano? Beltrano is a liar for hire for the defendants uh, the city of New York uh, I'll show you the legal paper. That's the best way to do it. This is October, Friday the 13th, the year 2000. And the court is the United States District Court for the Northern District of Alabama, Southern Division. It's Glendora Plaintiff versus the City of New York. It's Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. It's Parking Violations Bureau. It's Sheriff Teresa Mason, Peter Samarco, assistant to Michael Phillips, Deputy Commissioner, uh, Parking Violations Bureau, New York City, and Don Glow Auto Service Towing Defendants. This is the case where the city of New York and all these creeps uh, towed away my precious 1980 Lincoln, saying that there were three unpaid parking tickets. They had never served me the summonses on these three unpaid parking tickets. They wanted 600 and... Uh, twenty dollars or something like that. Uh, we went and uh, saw them and talked to them and presented them with the evidence that they had no proper service. They deprived me of my property without due process of law. Fifth Amendment and Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, I sued them uh, we, and all three summonses were uh, eventually vacated. All of them. And so I brought this case against them in the uh, United States District Court in Alabama. And this dumb uh, Wade Beltrano, he's a liar for hire for the city of New York. In other, way, other words, the city of New York can violate your rights, your Americans' rights, and then they go and hire a liar to cover it up. And that's, you pay taxes in the city of New York. So, this letter is from the so-called law department, city of New York. In Hillsborough Beltrano, and there's his signature. And this letter says to Acker, who is the judge on this case in Alabama, uh, that I am writing to notify the court of the City of New York's opposition to plaintiff's motion in the above reference matter returnable October 4, 2000. Needless to say, the city is opposed to litigating this action in the Northern District of Alabama as it is an improper and inconvenient forum. Please notify me if the court requires the city to submit formal uh, opposition papers. Very truly yours, Wade. Beltrano, B-Boy, E-L-T-R-A-N-O, Assistant Corporation Counsel. Memorandum by Glendora, re suspicious letter to court from Beltrano. Beltrano breaks a rule. Legal papers must be delivered by the same means to the opponent as to the court. Beltrano should know this. If Glendora has no facts and is served by mail, then the court must be served by mail, not facts. This is crooked number one. 
two, this letter is a public disgrace. Anybody in a corporation council office should know how to write a grown-up legal paper. The great city of New York should not stoop to puerile letters. Why are the people in the city of New York the dumbest people in America? They have the densest population. Defendants are in default. They have failed to appear, failed to answer, and failed to defend. The Beltrano Simpleton letter smacks of ex parte of his talking behind Glendora's back to the judge. Glendora wants the affidavit she requested in her Rule 60B motion of 917 that the judge write an affidavit that he has not uh, been improperly influenced by Beltrano and that Beltrano has not talked to the court ex parte. Defendants have not opposed Glendora's Rule 60B motion. It must therefore be granted. Uh, the Judge Acker down there, in a very lazy way, uh, transferred, said the case should be transferred uh, to the Southern District of New York. Glendora wrote a Rule 60B motion for relief from that order and that it shouldn't be transferred. And that was all read to you uh, previously. It must therefore be granted. Uh, this letter hardly rises to an adult legal paper. It is hardly needless to say, quote unquote, a vague and conclusory toss off hardly defends defendants against a transfer that is in violation of 28 U.S. Code section 1404. A transfer must be in the interest of justice. You know there's no justice in the Southern District of New York or the Eastern District of New York. Heaven knows a stack from the floor to the ceiling of evidence proving that. Beltrano eschews his call to show this. Asking the court to notify him if the court wants more papers is stupid. Beltrano should do the job needed sua sponte. Beltrano does not notify Dan Glow, Don Glow, that's the tow company, that charged $40 to tow a car seven miles. Beltrano does not state whom he represents. He names but one defendant. Uh, Don Glow has not defended itself. Rule 11, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, sanctions must be imposed on defendants for not doing what Rule 11 says should be done. Beltrano does not uh, declare he is fully aware of the facts and circumstances. Beltrano does not declare under penalty of perjury. Beltrano really has not certified he has standing. De facto, Beltrano has no answer to Glendora's papers. He has no meritorious defense. Dated White Plains, New York, Friday, the 13th of October, year 2000. Under penalty, the service list is the six defendants that I named to you, the Center for Judicial Accountability, you, the all-important Glendora TV audience, uh, the clerk of the court, Fiorella, Michael Phillips, Beltrano, and uh, under penalty of perjury, uh, Glendora declares she has served the within memorandum of three sheets upon six defendants, Beltrano, uh, together with all others on the service list, Super. Service was by United States Mail on Friday, the 13th of October, 2000. And I don't have the costs on this, uh, the costs. The cost of six dollars and something, and uh, about three hours work, and at uh, the total cost are uh, something like ninety-four hours. And uh, wait a second, I'll have to go into the other office and get the dollars. Five hundred and thirty-five dollars is what this violation of Americans' rights by the city of New York has cost this citizen. A reminder to you, the Funeral Planning Association
$535 is what this violation of Americans' rights by the city of New York has cost this citizen. A reminder to you, the Funeral Planning Association, uh, you want to be sure that you call ahead and get all of the information on how much you want to pay for a funeral. If you don't, the bill can go as high as $1,800. Uh, if you do, you'll have what you want and it can be as low as $200 to $500. So uh, if you have a funeral planning association uh, in your county, that's good. Go to them. Uh, we have one in Westchester. Uh, let me show you their letterhead. Funeral Planning Society. Uh, Funeral Consumer Information Society of Westchester Incorporated, uh, 468 Rosedale Avenue, White Plains, New York, 10605. So remember, you don't want the wrong thing done after you die, so control it and put it in writing ahead of time. Lest we forget, here's the crooked judge, uh, John P. de Blasi, okay, who missed uh, 31 mornings of court. Uh, he spent his time uh, in a TV class to learn to be a television caster and uh, instead of being in the courtroom. And he gets paid, he, they get paid more than the federal judges now, you know, the county judges. They get paid uh, over $130,000 a year. Okay, and that's your taxpayer money, and this is how this guy cheated. What's his name? John P. de Blasi. We've given you, from the floor to the ceiling, enough evidence against him to show you what he is like, and he should be out of there. Have you heard this week's jokes? Uh, you don't have to worry about the uh, judge losing his temper. He can find it if he needs it. And the uh, judge isn't as well off as you think. The telephone in his Lincoln is a party line. And one athlete says important is being invited to the White House, the Oval Office. And another athlete says, no, 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 important is you're in the Oval Office the telephone rings and the president puts the caller on hold. And the third athlete says, no, no, no. Important is you're in the Oval Office, the telephone rings, the president answers, and then he says, he hands you the receiver and says, it's for you. That's important. And the judge is temperamental. He's 50% temper and 50% mental. And on the judge's bench, there are three trays. One says in, one says out, and one says oops. I have taken uh, Rusty for four walks today. Again, the weather is precious. It's warm, it's sunny, it's a clear blue sky. There's no wind and there's no rain. It is perfect. Uh, so... We did some praying for today, and now we're going to do the think drawer. What is the think drawer? That's right. It's things that come in, you don't have time to think about them, so you put them in the think drawer. And the think drawer is way behind. Do you think this is funny? This was an ad in the idiot sheet, the idiot sheet being the sporting news, the baseball newspaper. You think that's funny? See, says out for lunch, back in five minutes, and here he is down here, eating his mounds bar. Is that funny? Okie dokie. And let's see what else there is. I've got to get out my wireless mic and see if it will work. The last time I used it, it was picking up people's telephone conversations and they were being recorded on videotape. 
Now I told you about Queens and the Notice of Appeal. You knew about that yesterday. Uh, you know about these pictures. Here's the pass you get at the police state, Mount Vernon High School. Kids should be learning that this is a republic. What are they learning? It's a police state. Here are the stock certificates. So this is the stock certificate for Gannett. These are worth money. Just be careful of these. Here's the stock certificate for Time Warner. And I'm going to oppose their getting the franchise in Mount Vernon. Here's a stock certificate for Texaco and Crooked Peter I. Bajur. Here's my birth certificate. Where was I born? Prescott. Do you know where Prescott is? It's in the state of Maine. Do you know where? Aroostook County. Uh, here is Franklin's Army discharge over five years from D-Day to Victory in Europe Day. Here is Glendor's diploma from high school, classical high school, Springfield, Massachusetts. And here's the birth certificate, State of Maine. Glendora Vesta Folsom. And here's a declaration that uh, if I get sick and go to the hospital, I don't want any tubes. Okay, that goes in the third compartment. What else is in here to show you? The little bear. He's so cute. Little tiny baby bear. And that I showed you. And the cat's cradle. Uh, pet assistants have to send them some money. And this bad Verizon. We're going to go pay the bills in cash because they keep losing checks. In fact, we're through with pet, with uh, Verizon, I hope, very soon. i got to get after MCI to get that hookup. And the who to sue file. I believe I've got to start these refiles, the who to sue, the new who to sue people, and then I have to start the uh, refiles. I have to start them. I have to get them going. I was hoping to get the work caught up. I was hoping to have some free time. And then I was hoping to wash the 1980 Lincoln and wash the 1993 Lincoln in a clean house. And then I would do the refiles, and then I would do the new who to sue. But it's never going to happen. I just have to schedule it. I'll have to schedule it and work on it a half an hour a day. Uh, let's take a look at the who to sue file. Uh, 1999. ever easy, is it? Uh, Westchester Supreme Court Library. Uh, Westchester County Police saying you can't pick it. Uh, charging 50 cents a copy, charging a dollar a copy. Um, a lot of these have been brought. It says here, on bank, uh, Wehrlein. We're going to sue Wehrlein. Uh, he's in Houston, a crooked judge in Houston. Uh, sue the municipalities in Westchester for uh, being snickered by TCI and losing public access 
and not protecting the public access producers. We're going to sue Ju Gershon, crooked judge in the Eastern District of New York, for violating uh, civil rights, the whole long list of civil rights I've read you before. Uh, maybe Cablevision for firing Steve Laurie and the appellate division clerk staff. They never get anything right. And they never tell you what's going on in the court. They don't send you notices. Uh, uh, Edward B. Everett, the uh, caveman who was driving a street cleaner in New Rochelle and sideswiped the 1980 Lincoln and did all that damage and then running away and hiding and lying. Uh, we're going to have to sue the city of New Rochelle over again and those police officers, Sergeant Kelly and O'Rourke. Uh, we're going to have to sue Cabranus et al. over again. These are refiles. And certainly Calabrese, no caliber Calabrese. And Pinkerton Security and Sweet. Here's another Pinkerton. And certainly the Boston First Circuit and the Boston District Court. The Boston District Court doesn't file the papers you submit and they file papers you don't submit. And then the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals in Boston, the first secret, uh, takes on appeals for which you've never signed a notice of appeal for their court. The notice of appeal is in other courts. One was in uh, the Fifth Circuit, New Orleans, and another was in the uh, Third Circuit, Philadelphia. Uh, we're going to sue the whole Second Circuit uh, for the way they do things, petition for hearing en banc. They don't pay attention to your papers. Uh, they have, uh, they don't sign orders, so nothing's ever any good. It's a nullity and it's void. And they have clerks do their work while they're out playing golf. We're going to uh, refile Mark D. Fox. So that's just the first folder of the who to sue. National Wildlife Federation, we have to send money to them. Here's the Time Warner uh, dividend check for four cents. And in the wake of the trials, the Puros decide to sell their home. This is the News News, uh, the employee paper of the Buffalo News where Franklin worked for 27 years. Federal judges reporting the greatest and least total investments. Very, very important. Remember there was a big fight about that. Judges trying to keep it off of the internet. Here was a great year, the year 1999. Such a pretty calendar. Sh Schumer hasn't amounted to anything as yet. And here he's on the Senate Judicial Committee, and he doesn't get rid of the bad judges. And he said he would. And I fasted until 4 p.m. for 30 days. Today is the 6th, and it's uh, 2 p.m. first compartment is done, and the new ones have been filed. Now we go on to the second compartment. BCAP program schedule. I believe Glendora is on there Friday mornings at 9.30 or 10.30. Uh, the ruling of the Second Circuit that a pro se's civil rights case cannot be dismissed in view of the well-settled rule. Cannot be dismissed. 
until the pro se has had can prove beyond a doubt no set of circumstances can keep her from getting her claim. This is Alexander Hamilton who first came to the attention of George Washington in the Battle of White Plains. Uh, Quest Communications, Trujillo, what a terrible job he did on U.S. West. That was awful. Two pay cable companies agreed to pay uh, $250,000, dollars $345,000 in rebates and refunds. Those two companies were Continental, Amos Hostel Company, and uh, the Cablevision. Ridebrook Residence becomes Administrative Judge. That's Jonathan Littman. Uh, he's in charge of the administration of the courts in New York County, only in New York County. Traffic County has the rest of the state. Uh, here's the rule that a judge has to rule on an order in 60 days. If the judge doesn't, then you win. That's a very, very easy one to catch them on because they don't pay attention to what's going on in the courts at all. Manhattan Neighborhood Network, that's public access in Manhattan, entirely apart from Time Warner, uh, producer grants. Uh, here are various uh, laws uh, that the cases have to be reported so that you can read them. Uh, here's the money that Glendora and Franklin have made and spent since 1937. The biggest item was airtime. $547,767. The lowest item is mileage paid people who did work for us, $275. This is the Greek alphabet that Patrick Galino gave me. He had to earn it, learn it during hazing. And Szechuan Empire, a Chinese restaurant in New Rochelle, has a vegetarian menu. I think that's wonderful. Uh, here's a uh, request for judicial intervention in the Crooked Appellate Division, Second Department. Here are some civil rights. Uh, this is a picture of that cheater who lost his company finally and got what he deserved, John Malone, John C. Malone, the one who robbed us of public access in uh, 20 municipalities in Westchester. Association of Public Access Producers. Letters from the church, and this is an ad that Cablevision bought for the Wiz, and Cablevision is a monopoly. Charles Dolan is a very greedy man, and these are some of Glendora's triumphs in other courts since you last heard from her, and this is uh, things about Frank Buell. And here's some refund checks, and oh, look at this, $10,000. And here's one for $1,000. And this one over here is for a million dollars. And this one is for $500. Isn't that fun? And this is the article that Newsday did on judges how the deals are made in the back room. And you, the public, you have nothing to say about it. They have stolen your courts. These people have stolen your courts. You have no court to go to. These crooked judges, these crooked lawyers, these crooked politicians have stolen your courts. And the last thing in the second compartment uh, is maps. This happens to be a map. Connecticut. 
Isn't that adorable? It's a greeting card, cats. Isn't that sweet? Income tax refund check, we don't get those anymore. There's a great picture of people laughing. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Must be an old picture because those are old styles. Her hair is an old style and her dress is an old style. That's nice to see people laugh. That's why we tell you jokes. And here's the, uh, the cute kitty. Here's a hamburger uh, made out of uh, animals. Tortured, agonized, terrified, and murdered. Our hamburgers don't do that to animals. I thought this was a pretty sofa. This is a sofa bed, purple. Rusty snoring. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't disturb him. I need the peace. Here is ACAP, the Association of Cable Access Producers. Uh, here is the law to recuse. Whenever a party to any proceeding in a district court, United States District Court, makes and files a timely and sufficient affidavit that the judge before whom the matter is pending has a personal bias or prejudice either against him or in favor of any adverse party, such judge shall proceed no further. Therein, but another judge shall be assigned to hear such proceeding. When somebody gets hurt, uh, either emotionally, spiritually, or physically, what do you do? What are the five things you do? The first thing you do with them is commiserate with them and say, tell a person he or she is right. That's the first thing you do. The second thing you do is tell them that they're right and the other side is wrong. And the third thing you do is to praise them, build up their confidence, praise them, tell them they did the right thing. The fourth thing you do is you help them find a solution to it. And the fifth thing you do is to give them a gift. Give them a dog yummy. Uh, 60 days to decide an order. Okay, uh, that's the uh, Civil Practice Laws and Rules 2219. Valentoni said to two lawyers, that's where the public gets the uh, ideas about lawyers, judges, and the court. He told that to a couple of lawyers standing before him. Medicare and you, year 2000. Homes. I don't want this home. Look at it. I don't want it. Uh, Franklin and Glendora's wedding. Uh, nuptials and contracts. The Village Voice, the article about public access. This is the last file of the third compartment, so the think drawer is done. Most of this is uh, cable vision pullouts and uh, crookedness by one uh, Robert Rodriguez in the Second Circuit on the Cablevision. He cheated. He, I, I caught him cheating. Uh, this is the Cablevision derivative action where all the people were caught cheating uh, on buying Cablevision stock on inside information and they were brought to court by Gladzinski and the case was settled. And uh, that was before good judge Stein. So it's 2.29 p.m. Franklin is sitting out on the sun porch and reading the uh, New York Times. Uh, I don't know if that's day. Yes, it is today. That's the end of the think draw. Uh, it was behind for four weeks. We've made that up. And now we're going to do legal paper number two. And that's the mess that Cablevision has made out of uh, not showing Glendora the shareholder list to which he has a statutory right. It's 2.30 p.m. on uh, Friday the 13th. And all good things.
have happened so far. All good things. It's October the 13th. We still have roses. The fence has been taken down. It's going to be replaced. You see what a beautiful day it is? Here's this fruit. I don't know what it is. Do you know what it is? I know what that is. And this is Franklin rotating the tapes. VHS and three quarter inch. And uh, packing up the box for next Wednesday uh, to prepare for the following Tuesday, which would be October 24. Patrick for five three quarter inch tapes. Three quarter inch tapes are too big and too heavy. I went out onto the porch and I heard some noise on the uh, desk five. Guess what? A squirrel was up there eating the uh, out of the big pail of uh, nuts or whatever they were, the things I found on the sidewalk. Oh. We don't know what they are. <laughs> and he was eating out of that and when I came he took one in his mouth and jumped down on the grass and went up the tree with it. <laughs> this is where he was, right here. And then he came down the tree. So I gave him all of them. I put some on this squirrel's tree down at the bottom. Do you know what these are? I can't get into them, but the squirrels can. Dover. And the balls uh, roll down the hill. So that's wonderful. That's wonderful that they find good use for them. Vision shareholder legal paper number two. It looks funny without the fence. So this is the pumpkin patch. And it's going to be easier for them if we move the car. Because see all the cement? Now they're going to bring in the cinder. This is Sam and Alfredo. And here's where the fence is. Nice old Cadillac. Beautiful old house. Nice old house. This is House Beautiful edition of a chat with Glendora. Beautiful old house. New house. I wouldn't give two cents for it. Nice old house. Nice old car. The other side of the nice old house. Uh, this is Saturday afternoon uh, at uh, 3.08 p.m. I can eat in 52 minutes.
so all right, let's take a look at uh, the settlement should never have been in the first place. That is my position. It should have gone full-blown before you, a jury. But it was swept under the rug, and that's Brian's way to do things. He wants to get things out of his way. He wants to get cases, get rid of cases. Uh, Texaco has collaborated with research firms to ensure that these and other mentoring efforts at Texaco, such as mentoring within the Executive Business Analysis Program, are consistent with best practices and lessons learned. Well, they're supposed to learn from the other business executives. Nobody at Texaco can learn to be fair and unprejudiced and unretaliatory when they have as a chairman Peter I. Bajour. Uh, the task force will monitor the results of these uh, assessments and will look to Texaco for evidence of mentoring participants' perceptions of the program's effectiveness. I ask the question again, who is monitoring the task force? Performance manage management process, this is paragraph 17A of the stipulation of the settlement. Uh, since completing and piloting the basic design of the performance management process in 1998, Texaco has continued to revive the performance management process effectiveness and has modified the process to strengthen its training, support, and assessment components. The company expanded use of its one-day training course, uh, Coaching for Performance Improvement. Well, Glendora, I want to see that. Okay, I want to attend. All right, I want to see this. I'm tired of listening to it. Which it successfully piloted in Midland in April 1999. The course, which uses videotaping to critique supervisors and managers' uh, coaching skills, is now also in place in Bakersfield. Harrison, okay, that's right here outside of White Plains. I want to see it. I want to see the videotape. As Werner Wolf says, let's go to the videotape. Show it to us. Okay? Over here, let's put down who monitors the task force. And over here, let's put Bajur as no model. Additional support and education on the uh, performance management process are provided through a special employee zone section on the company's intranet, intranet website. The employee zone contains uh, detailed information policies and procedures concerning the PMP, and the uh, website offers online guidance and assistance in writing objectives and completing the uh, performance management process. In addition, the intranet uh, site links the uh, PMP process to a number of other human resources processes at Texaco, including the job competency development process. Okay? Bajur could never pass. Remember the man who came home from work and his wife says, how did it go, dear? And the man said, work was terrible today. It was terrible. And his wife said, why? And he says, because they gave us an aptitude test. And I flunked. And his wife said, Oh, that's terrible. And the man says, yeah, it's a good thing I own the company. Okay. In last year's report, we expressed our concern about employee skepticism. I wouldn't doubt it. Me too. Regarding the fairness of the PMP process and the company's motives, indeed, Indeed. Always suspect Texaco's motives. Uh, this continues to be a challenge that Texaco faces in the most recent vision and value survey. Uh, 
Only 37% of respondents indicated their agreement with the view that the employee evaluation process supports a fair and unbiased environment. Yeah. Also Bryant. Bryant is the United States District Judge, I told you. Hello, Penny, white shoes. Penny has white sneakers and white gloves and a white vest. The task force understands that employees' perception of the PMP are in large part colored by the fact that the PMP was implemented during a downturn in business conditions that precipitated workforce uh, reductions. However, it is also the case that some managers and supervisors, and I remind them again that gas is now nearly $2 a gallon. A forced bell-shaped uh, curve uh, ranking that limits the number of exceptional and strong ratings. Uh, this misinformation is this misinformation. This information refers to the court and this report. There's a penny cat with the white sneakers and the white gloves and the white vest, and they're all black. Where have you been, penny cat? You better sit down and wash, penny cat. Uh, highlight the need for ongoing uh, training of employees, supervisors, and managers concerning the uh, value of the PMP. The task force will continue to monitor this aspect of Texaco's PMP process closely. Okay, who monitors the task force? All right. I don't see anything significant here or different or exciting. Uh, let me just finish uh, page 13. Job competency development. All salaried U.S. employees uh, completed leadership com competencies. Well, by your flunks on that. Uh, Texaco revised the 360 degree feedback process to integrate the newly defined leadership competencies. More than 750 supervisors and managers had participated in the revised process as of year 2000 June. 360 degrees. Okay, w well, about that, folks, what are you going to say? 360 degree. Okay? It goes in circles. Okay? Round and round. And we'll put the date on here, 1014 Saturday. All right. Let me see if I can't shorten this process. I'll read page 14 and read you my comments, okay? Is that a good way to do? Okay. The obfuscators uh, say that Texaco's uh, communication and education strategies for facilitating implementation of the job competency development process have been proven effective. As we reported last year, Texaco employed a three-pronged strategy consisting of one, an introductory brochure discovering the best in Texaco. I certainly discovered the worst. Glenn discovered the worst at annual meeting 2000. To a more detailed toolkit for superior performance. And three, a two-hour overview workshop conducted by internal facilitators. Let's see it. Uh, Glendora says, show them to us. As if we're from Missouri.
show them to us. Uh, Texaco implemented two other initiatives during the past year that are likely to educate employees about job-related competencies and to integrate the job comp. Well, integrate requires integrity. There's no integrity in the court, Charles Bryan Court, nor in Texaco. And then down here it says the competency development assessment is currently in the pilot stage. Uh, that means it won't fly. And that's page 14. Let me do a job here on page 15. Uh, it says here that the uh, task force will continue to assess Texaco's progress. Well, Glendora will continue to assess the task force. Next uh, topic is succession planning employee development. I suppose the successor to Peter Bajur has all been trained and uh, regimented in the lying, stealing, and cheating. employees with workplace complaints may elect to have an outside mediator or arbitrator review their complaints, decreased in 1999, and only four cases were filed through June of this year. The decrease lends itself to competing interpretations. On the one hand, that's a very bad, that's a dumb thing to say, and it's a dumb way to say it. On the one hand, the trend may be interpreted as a promising indicator of fewer complaints among employees. I want to see the employees' complaints. Don't you folks? Ombuds program. Paragraph 16D. 153 contacts each month. 
significantly up from the rate of 89 per month. The ombudsperson was able to resolve two-thirds of the contacts through telephone calls, while one-third of the contacts led to face-to-face -face meetings. Now, Bajur will not come to the telephone, and Bajur will not appear face-to-face. Let's see what we can do to page 18. Employment Selection and Performance Management, paragraph 17E. A decrease of 15.8%. 1,276 employees. They fired 1,276 people, which they euphemistically called uh, experiencing workforce decrease. The rest of it is the rerun statistics about women and minorities that I read to you um, when we started this project of the Texaco Task Force. We're on page 19. Uh, the pattern of inclusiveness was repeated in promotions as well. Overall, women and minorities, is that what they were wearing, overalls? received 66.7% of total promotions. This is a rerun. They told us this before. Texo again conducted its annual multiple regression analysis of salaries paid. Regression, going backwards. Approximately 5,600 salaried employees and concluded that 34 employees were eligible for equitable adjustments to their salaries, uh, suggests that salary discrimination is not currently a significant problem for any category of employees at Texaco. All right. Now, Texaco has again reported to the task force on its efforts to increase business opportunities for minority-owned and women-owned business enterprises through the Minority and Women Business Development Program. Well, you see, that's what Roberts versus Texaco was all about. It was the outside people that couldn't get contracts with Texaco. They all went to white males. Center for Advanced Purchasing Studies. That would be, I bet you find a lot of housewives there, right? Housewives know about advanced purchasing. As we observed in last year's report, the Minority and Women Business Development Program is not within the task force formal jurisdiction. A uh, cop-out, and accordingly, the task force has not evaluated Texaco's contracting practices with uh, minorities. However, we continue to believe that the company's efforts to expand business opportunities for minority-owned and women-owned vendors reinforce the Equality and Fairness Program implement. Okay, this is just belief, no factual basis. They're not kidding us, are they, folks? And um, cop out. No jurisdiction cop out. Okay, that's enough for today. Here's the second legal paper of yesterday. Uh, this is the shareholders list. And those Dolans, just to show you how dingy and dirty Dolans are, Right in broad daylight, they refuse to show a shareholder the shareholder's list. They, right there and there, break the law. This is how arrogant and how ignorant the Dolans are. Cable vision. So uh, this file was reviewed, it was paginated, uh, and the new law was read. And the, uh, there's a lot of things to do on this. Uh, I called Hill Gartner and asked him to go forward and bring the Dolans to court the way he promised to. And 
I called Rand, William Rand, to see if he wanted to get in on the uh, lawsuit against Texaco. And uh, I should call Dolan and Holm. I should write to North Hempstead and tell them what they're doing, how they're cheating and lying, and they are not fit to have the North Hempstead uh, franchise. I should find out where else the records are available. They should be available in the Secretary of State's office. Uh, they should be available at the transfer agent. I should uh, petition the Secretary of State of the State of New York to annul uh, their certificate of authority to do business in the State of New York because they break New York laws in broad daylight, as I just mentioned. I should also do the same for the Secretary of State of Delaware to uh, rescind their certificate of incorporation. And I want to make a demand to see the voting trust record. So that's what's going on with that and that took a couple of hours yesterday and that was legal paper number two. And here is the law, the New York State Business Corporation law, which says clearly the Dolans have to show Glendora the shareholder record. And yet they, right there, for the 60th time, they violate the law. Again, that's how dirty and dingy the Dolans are. Now the public file. This was reviewed. Uh, it was read. And it was paginated yesterday, and that was the third legal paper of yesterday. And uh, already uh, you can see ch uh, Cablevision trying to cheat and the Public Service Commission catching them at it. And that's in this correspondence. How they gypped you, the subscribers, and they got caught at it. So that's very... The Cablevision is going to flunk on the public file. I'm pretty sure of that. So, But let me continue looking at it until I find everything that they have in it and make a list of everything they don't have that they should have in it. This morning, after doing the 13 chores and taking care of the cats and walking rusty, uh, the first legal paper was file paginate hours and dollars for the Dolans, for Bruza Ken, for Street Cleaner, for Kasari, for Golf, uh, for Levin, uh, for uh, New York City Parking Violations Bureau, Civil Rico, for the New York Law Journal case and uh, for the court officer and the Neanderthal court officer number 1763. Uh, all of those things got done, the morning chores. They take about a couple of hours. And then uh, telephone 10, and you will hear all that on the audio tape for the telephone calls. And to uh, do the second legal paper of today, which was the Goldberg Newsletter. This is the Goldberg Newsletter, and it's very good. And what did it deal with today? It dealt with uh, the Association of Cable Access Producers uh, picnic meeting. Public access producer meeting at Cablevision. That's the one I reported to you on extensively. Uh, the internet and public access. That public access is not going to be replaced by the internet or the internet is go going to do away with public access and to keep on going. And the North Hempstead Town Board meeting to okay the franchise, which they didn't.